Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. On behalf of Ceramics of Italy, I wanted to welcome you all to Coverings 2016. After this session, I invite you to join us on the show floor to see the latest and greatest tile and stone introductions. I just have a few housekeeping things to go over before we start um, this morning. So um, first, we have a graphic recorder who will be illustrating the seminar and turning it into a piece of art. So I encourage you to make sure you check it out after the session. Um, second, please turn off your cell phones. And third, please be sure to use hashtag coverings2016 in any of your social media posts. We hope you're active on social media. Um, our moderator this morning really needs no introduction. She's the deputy editor of Interior Design and a lovely um, and wonderful person and a dear friend of ours. So without further ado, here's um, Edie Cohen. Thank you, Danielle. Good morning. When Coverings announced that this year's show would be in Chicago and asked me to put together a panel presentation, I was absolutely thrilled. Think of all the great designers that this town has. So I put together my dream list and figured maybe one or two people would respond positively. Guess what? They all said yes. So I am really the lucky one, and you are too, because that means we all get to share in their brilliance. Um, they need little by way of introduction. They're such superstars. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to present them to you, say a few words about them, and uh, then present some of the images and some of the projects that I've seen that make our theme of the cross-pollination of design and turn the program over to them. So the very per first person to say yes was my friend Todd Heiser, who's principal of Gensler. In Todd's tireless quest to present the most cutting-edge corporate workplaces, he's on flights more than George Clooney was in Up in the Air. But I think our Todd is cuter and far more witty. <laughs> I met Neil Schneider, senior associate at IA Interior Architects, when we were publishing the LinkedIn offices here in Chicago and in Toronto. And he was passionate about his clients. He was passionate about the work. And he approached design from a very holistic point of view, uh, involving the graphics team from the very get-go. And I thought that was quite interesting. David Grout is the design principal at Gary Lee Partners. He's dedicated to the big idea and its execution so that every space evokes an emotion, be it power, creativity, sophistication. He's also a real trooper. I think he just got off an international flight and headed up to the airport, headed over here from the airport. Eileen Jones, as principal and branded environments global practice leader at Perkins and Will, she develops solutions that tell stories through branding, experiences, and environment. Jordan Moser calls himself the little guy in the group, but I couldn't disagree more. Jordan is a hospitality giant. You know, we were talking about how hotels have broken down the walls between lobbies and food services, about how hotels are being designed as the new public plazas in, in cities, how they're gathering places not only for their guests, but for the general population of the city at large. And the same thing for restaurants. Hotel lobbies are where the action's at, and so are the restaurants. It used to be you wouldn't be caught dead eating in a hotel restaurant, but now they're destinations in their own rights. So, so much so that this whole evolution has made bedrooms and sleeping quarters in hotels merely places to rest your feet at the end of the day. They've got to be designed and they've got to be efficient, but um, everybody wants to be seen and see in the public places. Um, Jordan, too, makes sure that each of his stories adhere to a very, very strong narrative. So, on to our theme of cross-pollination. Whoops. I think you all know what I mean. Law offices want to look like lounges. Tech offices, although they're designed to the hilt and researched to the hilt, often look like adult playgrounds, although um, I'm assured that the sliding boards and the swings and the giant balls 
are just uh, sprinkles and icing on the cupcakes. The offices have to work. Retail wants to take on gallery or museum aspects. Healthcare seeks to promote wellness through a spa-like atmosphere or through treatments that uh, embrace color and graphics. As for hospitality, I think everyone wants to do that. And hospitality influences residential and vice versa. Here's a little bit what I mean. Well-traveled clients return home with images of their favorite hotels and they talk about these places with their designers. And they ask their designers, could you translate that space into my home? And on the flip side of things, um, hotels and hoteliers want their hotels to be warm and inviting, just like a home. Even low-income housing has gotten into a cross-pollination theme, if you will. Um, Low-income housing seeks to bring in landscaping and seeks to emphasize an indoor-outdoor aspect, particularly in LA where the climate is warm. So what I'm getting at is the absolute blurring of boundaries and the fact that all product, project types draw from one another. I guess that makes perfect sense because designers themselves are always seeking to break down their boundaries and break out of their own comfort zones. They cross-pollinate as well, drawing from project type to project type. So let's turn to a, a few projects that I've seen recently that make the point. This is the newly opened Rick Owens shop in Los Angeles. Uh, it's in a sort of dicey section still of Hollywood. This was a 1930s ribbon factory. And Anna Tumani, who does all of the Rick Owens store, stores uh, around the world, turned it into a very gallery, museum-like setting. Um, the lighting is impeccable, the detailing is impeccable. It makes perfect sense because Rick himself designs some of the furniture pieces as objects of sculpture. These are the fitting rooms, and if that doesn't look like some sort of a Dan Flavin installation, I don't know what does. Douglas Elliman, the luxury real estate broker, is well known in New York, and they wanted to make quite a statement when opening their Los Angeles office. So uh, they found a site in Beverly Hills. It was the former William Morris offices, and they leased two floors and couldn't have made a better choice than asking Patrick Ty to design the space. There are two aspects to this job. Uh, the ground floor, which is the public face, and uh, it's for meetings between the agents and their clients, and it's also created as an event space. Uh, Interior Design had its one night only LA event there just two weeks ago. So there's the wow gesture, of course. There's the grand staircase connecting the two floors. Upstairs is where the agents work. The other aspect was that they wanted it to be residential, like the high-end residential real estate that they handle. So they created these, uh, the lounge is very much living room-like with uh, two vignettes. And when I walked in and saw it, I said, Patrick, you know where I live. Like, could you transport this to my own living room? The Helmut Lang shop in Los Angeles was designed by the husband-wife team of Sylvia Kuhl and Jeffrey Allsbrook of Standard Architecture. It, too, is very gallery-esque. Need I say more? The Rockwell Group is probably one of the largest firms in the world or handling um, hospitality. Neuhaus in Los Angeles is kind of a hybrid, as you might know. I think there's a Neuhaus in New York. It combines workspaces, temporary workspaces. There's a, a, a lounge aspect to it. There's a food service. There's dining. There are terraces. <clears throat> 
This is in a part of Hollywood called Capitol Square. The site is, was the old CBS headquarters with William Pally's office in it. This is one of the most uh, interesting projects we've worked on for a while. It's going to be in our April fashion issue. Uh, it is a complete disruptor because the project is as much about retail as it is uh, about technology. It's designed as a completely prefabricated unit composed of four uh, modules. Uh, they're manufactured in Las Vegas, flatbed shipped anywhere in the country. The first installation came up for a month and it was right here in Chicago. It was for Tom's, but the whole project is, the whole, uh, project is called Shop With Me. And what happens is that this is not owned. It's a retailer will lease it, they'll lease the unit, and they will select the site for a certain period of time and then have it installed and work with the Shop With Me tech team to develop their own computer graphics, their own uh, lighting systems. This back wall is called the shape wall and it's composed of hundreds of little pixelated screens the, on which the um, retailer can can uh, have a uh, lighting system or graphics program. These little uh, units move in and out as shelving, and they sense a, a customer as it walks as he walks by. The kiosks are also wired to the hilt. You can place an object, say a handbag or a shoe on the glass surface, and information about this product pops up on the screen monitor next to it. So it will tell a product description of how much it costs, what uh, colors are available, sizing options. On the right, you see the fitting rooms, and there are swaths of felt that are retractable into the ceiling. Okay, what is a cruise ship other than a floating hotel? That's what Rote Studio called the Viking uh, Star Cruise Line. This is the, the Viking's first ocean-going vessel. They're known for their river cruise lines. Uh, tons and tons of constrictions as far as uh, code and safety and health uh, projects. It's full of lounges, restaurants, sleeping quarters, public spaces. If you were to look at this image, I bet you wouldn't figure out what it is. Is it a, a lounge, a club, a futuristic installation? Nope, none of the above. It's an immense facility for a data service center. All of the walls were built out um, because the Chinese did not like to see any kind of exposed columns or mechanicals. Even the mechanical room is a graphic statement. They used eight shades of blue in the ceiling to allude to the cloud and the, the glass tile flooring is digitally printed with the same imagery so it feels as if you're walking on air. I chose Kengo Kuma's pigment store in Tokyo also from our March issue because I just love these images. Paint and pigment, an art supply store, it could very well stand on its own as an installation because look at that beautiful sculptural ceiling composed of bamboo. Even the displays are artistically arranged. And yes, there is a sculptural installation at the entrance.
So we can't talk about the tech workplace without having a Studio O&A project. Primo Opila and Verda Alexander were our 2015 Hall of Fame inductees. And they've made these projects fun, but more importantly, as I said, they've made them work. So Yelp in San Francisco was part of a portfolio of tech and finance offices that we published in our February issue. Millennials pretty much want the same thing. They want options of places to work. They want lounge spaces. They want food. Couldn't this be a hotel lobby anywhere? So in Barcelona, the St. John of God Hospital wanted a uh, pediatric facility with graphics to make kids feel a little bit better about being in this place. So, but the graphics program that they wanted, wanted it to be kid-friendly, but not infantile. So I think you get the point, and I'm going to turn this over to the next of our panelists. David? Oh, sure. You're on. Oh, I have slides? You do. Oh my gosh. OK. Um, this is actually one of our restaurants out here in Mountain Prospect, not in Chicago. Um, <laughs> When referring to the, the topic, the cross-pollinization of, of the work, you know, we, we started out in workplace and started doing residences and then eventually hotels. And what was interesting to me was borrowing what we took from hotels into residences to make them look more expensive, even though they were cheaper. And so the, it's really a financial thing. When you look, think about um, hospitality um, venues, they're really based on revenue-producing uh, areas which is different than an office. You think about office to house people, but those actually are revenue uh, generating places as well. This is Hava Chicago, which is here above Italy in uh, on Ohio Street. And um, this center space is adaptable for many different events during the day and the bleachers pull back into the wall, but it's a big place for everyone to come together. Agency work is you, you work together go away to your own space, work together. So this, this constant movement is happening back and forth within this space. And it's actually very quiet, even though it's um, uh, very large and very open and very dense. Uh, this is the Hyatt-centric um, here in the Loop, first of its brand. And it, it's really a place, a, a bouncing off place for urban nomads so they can explore the city. And, and the, their subtle cues in the, in the paintings, this is based on Crown Records down in um, uh, Southside, uh, which was started all the blues and jazz musicians of the day. So um, it's a nod to the city without being overt. Um, very inexpensive project, but again, trying to make it look expensive in a very tight budget. Uh, Park High, this is a Bottega suite on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> so um, all the Bottega products and, and branded uh, for the Park Hyatt Hotel. There's also an Armani uh, suite in there. This is a house um, we completed in Aspen, and very open, very light, um, very peaceful, everything you want in a mountain village. Hi, uh, this is actually, as a, as a workplace designer, I think the topic that Edie talks about really resonates with me because I split kind of my time uh, between workplace and hospitality. So this is a project for Capital One. It's Digital Labs, um, where they very much wanted to blur the lines of what their employees would experience. And they also wanted to blur the line about what people would perceive a bank could be. Um, you know, uh, when you think about finance, there's uh, nothing more than you think about about wanting to be comforted that kind of everything is fine and safe, and so they really took the you know the the methodology of home and applied it to the workplace, um, and so there's a lot of different uh, hallmarks throughout the space, but in general a lot of texture. Um, certainly uh, the aesthetics of Chicago, something that is raw but uh, quite finished at the same time, 
and a real chameleon of, this, of a space. They wanted the space uh, to really adjust to the different kind of activities that uh, would occur throughout the space. This is actually perched above Wacker Drive on the river right where the river walk is. And so uh, the creation of a, a tiered space, uh, almost a, a porch or a patio out overlooking the river, uh, giving up almost 40,000 square feet of lease space to uh, their employees to kind of enjoy the space. Uh, and we actually uh, played a lot with the nature of uh, tiering the space in a high-rise building. Uh, we actually worked with a graffiti artist to cover uh, roll-up grills that gave kind of the notion of an alley in Chicago, if you, you know, know about Chicago. Uh, the big difference between Chicago and New York is that Chicago has alleys uh, and a little bit of a different culture. But nonetheless, uh, these were two-sided offices that really allowed uh, the occupants of the offices to open up their space almost as though it was a, a bazaar or a souk so that when people walked by, they could really understand that there was a different kind of activity occurring in the space. This is a project uh, steps away from uh, the Hancock Center down on Michigan. Uh, it's a church, uh, Fourth Presbyterian Church. In addition, we did, I think one of the most meaningful things about this project is that uh, a lot of people define this as one of uh, the most beautiful buildings in Chicago. It's a place on Michigan Avenue where all of the retail stops. There's a courtyard, uh, and so it was really about the creation of someplace different. Uh, you know, a religious uh, institution that really wanted to kind of capture uh, the notion of home. Uh, so this is actually the chapel, a real, uh, you know, transformable space. What you're seeing in this image is a labyrinth, a meditative um, kind of space uh, that we actually laser cut uh, two uh, colors of limestone into the floor to allow kind of uh, users of the space to really spend some time in the chapel very much alone. The back wall is actually an unpatinated copper wall. But this project was really a study in kind of textures. The entire outside of the building is copper panels that were aged and uh, it becomes actually a foil to the Bedford limestone facade of the existing church. And if you've walked down Michigan Avenue, you've probably seen this, uh, this church before. A project in Columbus, Ohio, actually, it says Chicago, but uh, it's for an art collector in Columbus, Ohio, uh, who is actually one of the founders of The Limited, which I always thought was interesting because he had a real uh, knowledge of materiality and really wanted a project that was about living with art, uh, prolific art collector. Those circular canvases on the black, back wall are cause, um, and he really wanted to create a play on texture. So the floor is actually uh, three uh, colors of marble that were uh, hand cut and placed together uh, to create almost an overscaled mosaic. All of the textures in the property really play off of the art and don't really allow you to pinpoint the, uh, the, the time that the hotel was created. So you have wood ceilings, you have columns that actually grow out of um, simple rounds to be almost kind of articulated uh, capitals. Uh, but I think you can see this. And then obviously a bar that transforms to day to night. The mirrors slide down and actually cover the alcohol and expose an espresso machine. Uh, and then this project is actually, uh, sh in a shocking way, a healthcare incubator uh, that actually uh, talks about the tension between the natural and the man made, um, the basic notion of biotech. Uh, when you walk in this, that brightly colored dichroa glass you see actually uh, plays Maslow's game of life, recording your movements as you walk through the space, and reminds us that um, oftentimes when our bodies uh, can't do the right things, there are uh, a whole number of, uh, of uh, prosthetics and prescriptives and uh, you know, help that we can get from other sources, and it's the real center for this. This is actually in the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. Uh, and, you know, their tagline is do something that matters. The whole notion of this is that, um, you know, being a hero is the ticket into this space. And so everything uh, ties into that notion of biotech. Uh, but when you get into the workplace, you can really see uh, the floor is actually printed uh, pattern of brain maps uh, and, uh, you know, really influences that notion of home. 
My design life began really doing both corporate and retail, two very different things. And when we realized what corporate was all about as a design solution and what retail was like as a design solution, we began to wonder whether we could take the learnings from both of those industries and begin to look at how we might influence showroom design. So I'm talking about m more years ago than I'm willing to admit. <laughs> um, but when you think about cross-pollination of different industries, it's been going on for quite some time and maybe we just haven't realized what we've been doing in, in building those spaces. So some of the things that I'll share quickly this morning look at different ways in which we're informed and influenced by other industries within the industry that we're working and for the client type that we're working. And our work is about telling stories and reflecting culture of place and the people that occupy those spaces and places and building experiences for them that build emotional bonds. And tying to those emotional bonds is really critical because that's what gives people a reason to believe in their attachment to an organization, to an institution, to an association, whatever that might be. So I'm starting with a little project for uh, Be The Match in Minneapolis. They match donors with patients who have blood cancers all sorts of blood cancers. And the space is about telling their story and their successes and how those donors and patients come together. So as we approach this space from the exterior in terms of its walkway and its street presence, some of the storytelling comes to the street. And we've used this inside passageway and corridor area almost as an external billboard, even though it occupies an interior space. So bringing urban presence to an office environment and thinking about what the impact of that expression is at a street level. When we step inside, we're looking at a little bit of um, both office and hospitality influences. Uh, a communal sort of farm table where people can work and chat and meet, but also co more comfortable lounge spaces where private conversations can be held and the beginnings of a way to approach a particular problem begin to be managed. And the stories that are told from the values of the organization, so engaging the people that work there, but also the people that visit there and even looking at a third party community run cafe that engages the community within this organization to help bring a little bit of relief to this environment as people are beginning to map a treatment that may mean the difference of life or death. So creating environments that help them begin to bridge their journey in, um, in a healing process. This is a, a showroom space completed just a couple of years ago, and I had the opportunity of seeing Edie there, um, which really looks at an idea about urban grit, and again, graffiti, <laughs> meeting showroom, meeting office environment, meeting sort of a little bit of a residential quality in the end. So we looked at Los Angeles and the multiple communities that make up Los Angeles, and because this space occupies a premier top of tower location and has views 360 degrees of the city of Los Angeles, we were able to connect community art or street art with environments that were built inside of the space. So we actually created the graffiti that grounded these environments and became a way to begin to tell a product story for Hayworth. So from large scale reception, down to individual meeting places and into work areas and even looking at those spaces that may be more comfortable as a home like casual lounge setting. All of those things come together to create an environment that's reflective of the product's flexibility but also reflective of the location and the place in which it's located. 
And even in the image on uh, your left-hand side, dimensionalizing that graffiti in a way that tells a story about the product and Hayworth's commitment to creating products that create spaces that ultimately create places for workers. The Purina Animal Nutrition Center, um, if you can imagine, this, this barn really was a barn. Uh, it was a pig barn. And you'll see some homage to pigs once we walk inside the space. But this is a conference center, but it also has a mixture of museum type space because we're telling a story about Purina, their commitment to animal nutrition, and what that means to us and the impacts to us as individuals who may be consuming those animals in our food cycles. So beginning to craft a story from the exterior and how we approach this environment, creating spaces for those meetings and conferences and learning sessions to take place, but supporting it with a story that begins to talk about Purina's commitment to animal health and wellness and looking at the ways in which artifacts and objects are embedded in the environment to extend that story, and looking at interactive ways that you can gain information and take information with you and celebrate mission and vision as well as achievements, things like patents that they've been successful in obtaining over the years. So engaging through story and engaging through the process and the purpose of the facility in and of itself. So in the healthcare environment, who would have imagined that you could think about healthcare as art gallery? And in this case, this is a cancer center for Johns, Hos Johns Hop Hopkins Hospital, hard to say. Um, and looking at the public spaces as opportunities to engage art, again in a childlike manner, but not childish in nature so that one is distracted from the, the seriousness and the significance of why you're in the healthcare environment, trying to reduce stress, and at the same time create a backdrop that creates interest for those that are visiting there or being admitted there. So the space is engaged with color and with form and shape and creatures that, in, uh, that really inspire you as you move through this environment and create a passage to a place where you know that eventually you can be healed and cared for. And the figures are larger than life. Uh, most children enjoy that change of scale, that sense of wonder as they move through environments that makes them pause and think and imagine. So through art, creating a way for them to think creatively and, and distract them from something that's a very serious part of their life and their condition. And where art takes on not only things that are untouchable, those things that are hanging in the space, but to interactive pieces that you can sit in, sit on, and explore while you're visiting there. And another interpretation of how we think about environments that cross references is work for the University of North Texas. This happens to be a student union in Denton. And today, higher ed environments are a mixture of many things. In this case, not only housing the student offices and government in which we need to think about our experiences from the office realm, but also thinking about hospitality and how we create environments where people have moments to relax um, or experience the grandness of space and what the spatial relationships are one to another, how we help them think about working their way through the environment, whether that's through information or color cues and allowing the architecture to be as expressive as the words that we may choose to tell their stories and thinking about how we see space one through another and layer the storytelling and the engagement of people as, as we move through those environments. And in the image on your left, you're seeing a three-story sculpture that is made up of the words of their values. So every day as people pass through here, they're reminded of why they chose this place to engage in for their education 
And as you move up through the environment, those words begin to disintegrate into the individual letters and you can begin to reimagine your own story as you ca care to cast it in this environment. Also looking at using the floor plane. Um, the fight song is embedded in the terrazzo floor. So as you move through here every day, you're reminded of place and where you are and, and what you've committed to. And finally, looking at a way to tell individual stories, in this case, celebrating alumni and the extent to which their reach um, is, is global in nature and embraces all of the people that live and work and teach and study here. Thank you. Um, I've been with IA, I'm fortunate to be with IA for 10 years now, and um, in that process been to work with a lot of different companies. So uh, my breath goes from technology to hospitality to legal. So when I looked at the cross-pollination of where we're going with the coverings, it was looking within the workforce and how we're actually developing spaces. So um, we'll start off with just a project in a confidential law firm, of course, in New York. And what we looked at is that kind of more residential flavor to the law firm, very sleek, modern edges, um, but looking at the mix of luxury materials. Um, law firms today still are using a lot of that in their spaces, whether it's uh, real stones, um, luxury carpets. Um, we're using stone more in conference tables, uh, surrounds, credenzas, um, really playing with those luxury materials in a different way. Um, I think law firms are changing quite a bit. Um, they're becoming more collaborative in nature. They're opening up the floor plates. Um, but again, you're starting to see this refined palette that is developed. Uh, one of our clients that we work with globally is LinkedIn. Um, and it's been a pleasure to work with them across the board because their, envir um, their environmental graphics story really takes on the nuances of the local flavor. So this on their uh, main reception is actually laser cut uh, MDF panels to create the map of Toronto. And you'll see, of course, the local LinkedIn logo um, pinpointing the location of their offices. Um, when we look at technology companies today, they're all about a large mix of materials. They're a, lar a large variety. They want it fun, they want it interactive, um, and they want to challenge their staff in different ways. So I think it was fortunate to be able to uh, work with them and try and bring this little bit of Toronto flavor in, whether it was with the graphic wall covering that was based off of birch and then staining the concrete with that. Um, you'll see the in bug um, on the right made out of ping pong balls. So part of their culture is that they have this world of games and they solve solutions over some of those games. They have those moments. Um, as playful as uh, some tech companies become, we still have to make them highly functional. So what we do is we look at a variety of materials to uh, hide acoustics. So you'll see there's a little row homes that are a signature piece of Toronto culture in the back layered with felts to actually absorb a lot of that noise. I think if you think about the covering industry, uh, tech companies tend to lean towards a lot more of that polished concrete look. So we're seeing that hit the marketplace on really most all of our projects. So the playful tiles, um, that kind of strong geometries that we're seeing start to roll into whether they're in pantries um, and mixed um, spaces. Mesro Financial here in Chicago is, uh, again, probably a more refined, elegant space. So when we looked at that um, environment, Again, they wanted a kind of a grand statement for their conference center, um, pushing a lot of those um, nicer finishes down to that level and then kind of refining it as it goes up the stack. So you're going to start to see a lot of mix of different carpets, uh, paneling, which has not really gone away, um, marble floors. Um, they wanted this to be a statement piece for the company. Um, again, when we had breakout areas, that's where you're starting to see that mix of different tile products. So as we um, layer that in, it's a way of getting that sparkle and that little bit of uh, jewelry, I guess, to the space is really within the tiles and the products, the stone products that we're starting to put in. 
Um, this is a product a project that we just finished in Boston. Um, this is for Sonos. So again, it goes back to the idea of what um, technology, again, I, I work a ton in the tech field, um, and what they're looking for materials. They, they like this eclectic mix. They like the openness. They like the nod to nature. So again, how do we subtly layer things into spaces? Um, again, the, the living wall um, echoes a little bit of the Sonos brand, but subtly within the plant life. Um, you're seeing this kind of spin back on some of the classic designs. So again, it kind of this bohemian mix of materials, um, space, um, fixtures. Uh, again, in this, you're just seeing more of their open office. They're a highly collaborative environment. So again, with most tech firms, they work in more of a, an agile form where you know, they'll go meet in a, a library or a living room for maybe an hour, hour and a half, and then they'll go back to their desk for a little bit more focused work um, and bounce throughout the space. Um, I was fortunate actually a couple years ago to be part of the rebrand of United Airlines United Clubs. Um, and in that, you're going to notice there's a lot of stone um, and solid surfaces within it. I think one of the challenges is the high use of these um, spaces. We were brought on to help them build a club that was centered around uh, the business worker. So instead of hiring a hospitality designer, they wanted to really get into the idea of what workplace could be. So within this space, you're going to see a lot of mixed types of uh, collaborative zones, independent zones, quiet zones for their um, business travel to come in. But you'll see on the uh, staircase coming up, it's laser cut um, marble that is actually supposed to be uh, reminiscent of the waves or the wind kind of blowing across the plain. Uh, a beautiful uh, limestone product on the floor called Noblato uh, is based on cloudy day. So really the idea of how do we take the stones and the materials that we're using within the space and then have a subtle nod to what they do as an industry. You'll see the flight patterns that we carved into the ceilings and the turbine engine, the custom light fixtures designed like turbines of the plane. So again, really focusing more on the business traveler, but having that luxury use of material throughout it. Um, we did rolled uh, Corian walls throughout the space, so it may look like white drywall, but it, the idea is really that when bags and roller boards come through, they can come through, clean the space pretty fast and easy. Thanks. No problem. Hi, I'm Jordan. <clears throat> this is a... Uh, a hotel we designed in Hamburg, Germany called East. It was uh, an old ruined foundry that was kind of mossy and tattooed with graffiti when we first walked in there. And our, uh, it's become a hotel and a very, very busy restaurant. And our client, Christoph, says, you can sleep here too. Mm -hmm. the, idea of having a hotel was kind of an afterthought. It was um, a cross-pollination here because Christoph's orientation is towards um, creating restaurants. And this is uh, an example of cross-pollination that's gone through our practice for about 30 years. We consider ourselves uh, American designers. America is a country of immigrants. And we get ideas from all these different immigrant groups that comes together and we have a, a contemporary culture that's constantly changing. The cross-pollination that we look for um, comes from other art forms like method acting and painting and philosophy like the um, thoughts of Carl Jung, one of Freud's students, and writers like the magical realists from South America and surrealist painters. We, um, we also are interested in the cross-pollination of disciplines. Um, how does uh, art influence architecture? How does storytelling influence design? How does the process of manufacturing and construction management influence our design? And so at East Hotel, we managed both the construction of all the plaster that creates the images on the left. And we manufactured the furniture um, to tell the story of the building um, 
by casting it, casting it in recycled aluminum, casting it in, um, in resins, and <clears throat> oops. We also tried to create a kind of surrealism by creating contrast between the spaces. And so the image on the right-hand side of this area is on the second floor of the left-hand side of the photograph. And at the ground floor is this space. It's all brick. It's the leftover of the old foundry. So part of the cross-pollination here is adaptive reuse. We're telling the story of the old uh, building. This is the image of the guest room in which almost every component is cast. Um, in Times Square, we similarly uh, created a lobby space that had five different food and beverage outlets. Each one had a little bit of a different personality. We tried to tell the story of place and infuse the interior design with what was outside. So there's a big X where 7th Avenue and Broadway crossed to create Times Square. And we used the X to create columns. In classical times, a Corinthian column or an ionic column represented a woman. Here we have two Xs, the chromosomes of a woman. Across town, for the same group, we created Hotel 57, which was inspired by the 1920s architecture of the building, which was uh, created by a fashion designer named Mr. Bloom and for, uh, for ladies, uh, flappers in the 20s. And it was purchased by the Apple Real Estate Investment Trust. So we took Apple and Bloom, we took Apple Blossoms, and we made our own tiles out of cast bronze and we fit them into wood floors and um, stone floors. And on the left-hand side in the background, there are walls made out of Carrera marble with little fasteners that are Apple Blossoms. All the spaces have long verticals, kind of the um, ideal woman from the 1920s, um, tall, thin, not much in the way of breasts. <laughs> when Frank Lloyd Wright looked out into the landscape of the prairie, he saw horizontals and cubes. We saw um, the curved forms, kind of the um, hills and crops. Um, forming long curves. And those are the forms that we use to inspire this restaurant building in Minneapolis. So the sense of, we give the place a sense of place by relating it to its context. But sometimes the context is problematic. In Southern California, there, it, I think it grew up really quickly and there's a lot of buildings that are made out of stucco and drywall. And we created a bunch of restaurants down there um, called Stacked. And Stacked restaurants are based on the bottom left image here. Um, it was an idea to take an iPad and allow guests to create their own uh, meals, their own sandwiches, their own salads. So the guest becomes the artist. The guest becomes um, the creator. And so we wondered what would be the right imagery? What's the right mythology for an artist? And our, uh, our solution was the mythology, the, what Jung would call the archetypical contemporary artist living in a loft. And so we built a place out of rusty steel and 1920s uh, style windows, and we built the cabinets out of steel, kind of like the lofts where I grew up um, here in Chicago. The artwork above is also a blend of ideas. In the top left, the red the four red images. We start with the image from the east of yin and yang, an idea of spiritual um, kind of wholeness. And it transforms into a Western idea of um, romance. So these two hearts make up a yin and yang. On the right-hand side on the top is another kind of cross-pollination, synesthesia. And uh, here, these are, this is a couple of images of what music might look like if you could see it. Recently we did a dinner with Chef Paul Kahn. We listened to some jazz and then he cooked what the jazz might taste like and we made paintings and sculptures about what that same jazz piece might look like. Here in Chicago we recently completed Oak and Char restaurant. Um, Oak and Char is um, 
celebrates local food, seasonal food, regional food, and the oak barrels and charred oak barrels that cure wine and whiskey. And so thinking about oak and char, we thought about the Chicago fire, and we burned pieces of wood to create partitions, and we took a white oak tree that had been felled in a lightning storm and created the tabletops, and the light fixtures became clouds. We're telling a local story to go along with the local chef's story. For Chef Michael Cordua in Texas, we've been inspired by both reading the works of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, an American writer who uh, won a Nobel Prize, um, he's from Colombia, uh, won a Nobel Prize in 82, and his magical realism um, mixes kind of a Western reality, which is kind of hard and logical, with the magical realities of the indigenous people and the African slaves that make up his society. And this idea of a magical reality seems like a wonderful analogy for hospitality, a place to escape, a place where um, a fantasy. And so we also read some works by Cormac McCarthy, who writes about 1850, the wars between the English and the Comanches and the Mexicans for Texas. And so we made partitions for this project out of the same felt that they make cowboy hats out of. And the image in the bottom right-hand corner is our creature table, which is named after my brother, but inspired by um, the Inca gold sculptures and the uh, Nazca lines, uh, big geoglyphs from South America, as well as contemporary graffiti from Rio de Janeiro. The illumination in the bottom left comes from what we call our Rasta lamps, which is glass blown to have dreadlocks on them. So a lot of these ideas started in 1990 when we were in San Francisco working on this project, the Cypress Club, which is uh, in a neighborhood in San Francisco where there are a lot of old bar uh, and grill spaces, big taverns. They had high wainscots and brass and leaded glass windows and lots of tile on the floor. And we, it's also right by City Lights Bookstore, which was uh, the publisher of the guy on the top left, Jack Kerouac, who in the great American novel On the Road drives a 1948 Hudson at 90 miles an hour across the country, stopping only for jazz and apple pie. And Thomas Hart Benton was painting around this time. He was a uh, very American um, creator. Uh, and he was doing realistic kind of cartoony images instead of abstracted, um, non-figurative European abstraction. And we were asked by the owner of this restaurant to create a vehicle for new American food. New American food was taking kind of European techniques, local ingredients, local wines from Napa Valley, and mixing them together using Asian techniques and Latin American techniques. This is very American. And we thought that the pudginess of the Thomas Hart Benton paintings and the 1948 Hudson's would be a great way of expressing this kind of American optimism. So on the right-hand side, we have Carl Jung, who um, offers us, even though he's um, from Europe, he offers us a very American idea of uh, archetypes. He says that uh, these same characters appear across the world. and. Um, and there are archetypes in our lives every day. This is, seems to me to be American. It's kind of a pluralist attitude. We learned from Annie Leibovitz as she makes a photograph of Meryl Streep manipulating herself, imagining the backstory to cross-pollinate her characters with um, her imagination. She imagines what's in the script, more than what's in the script. And the image on the left is by Saul Steinberg, who uses a different rendering technique to express the personalities of different characters. My favorite one is the child who's a little bit fuzzy in the bottom right. And so how does that influence design? How can we cross-pollinate design with different personalities? We had two projects in New York, one on the west side near Lincoln Center, the one on the east side, um, which was the Fred's restaurant at Barney's. Near Lincoln Center, we let ourselves be influenced by the idea of the ballet and the symphony and the opera. And so 
the floor there becomes uh, a Persian carpet, like the one in Clara's Dream and the Nutcracker. And the bar stools have leg warmers and toe shoes, and they're arching their backs like ballerinas. The columns there were influenced by Rodchenko's constructivist studies, kind of cubist pieces for uh, the opera. On the right-hand side, we crossbred a restaurant with a market. So we had um, fresh bread and a cheese market and old wines. And we let the style um, of 1960s Milano influence what we were doing. In a neighborhood uh, fusion restaurant in Japan, where there are a lot of kids, we wondered what would it be like to walk into a cartoon, a manga cartoon. And so we created a space that had the curves that you'd have in a, uh, in a cartoon or a manga. As you walk up the stairs, the first newel post stands up straight, and the second one bows very politely to you. But to get into this fusion restaurant, you have to reach out and grab a bronze Mickey Mouse hand and shake hands with it because it's about America. And to give, leave, you need to give the door high four, not high five, because Mickey Mouse only has four digits. Another idea of magical realism that we experimented with was um, taking influence from Shakespeare's last play, The Tempest, which has themes of intoxication, romance, service, and um, enchantment, which seems like perfect analogies for um, hospitality. So everything here was windblown. All the forms were windblown. And the tile, because we're at the coverings show, tells the story. Uh, in the right-hand side of this image, we see Caliban, the fish monster, the son of a witch, talking to the court jester, who I think is Trinculo. Um, so around this time, in the early 90s, George Lucas comes to us and asks us to help him and some of his friends fix a broken shopping center, a couple of broken shopping centers, by cro uh, blending them, by cross-pollinating shopping centers where you do your daily work with Bourbon Street where you do your daily play. And we worked on that for a while and then those ideas, uh, we worked on those for Disney and Universal Studios, but they really took root in Las Vegas where the, um, we created kind of uh, spaces like these at Bellagio where we'd have impulse retail, stuff that you want but you don't need, mixed together with bars and jazz clubs and restaurants and casinos, places to play. In this restaurant we had, um, on the left side, this is one restaurant, on the left side we have the, the place where you eat, the dining room, and it kind of has the color of cooked bread or roasted chicken and some of the imagery is borrowed from southwestern indigenous architecture. On the right side, we imagined an ice cube in the desert melting cool. I'm always too hot in Las Vegas. So some of those ideas about cross-pollinating older models we took to Volkswagen in Hanover, Germany, where at a very, very large factory in the center of the country where guests, customers come to pick up their cars, and we created a restaurant like the interior of an old bug, which was my first car, and a children's center, a children's play zone, uh, to try and teach kids about combustion engines, which I don't understand. The tubes on the side, the exhaust is actually a three-story slide. Um, also in Germany, and I'm almost at the end, mm -hmm. uh, we took another old model uh, the department store, which is like a big box, and we went to the board, we say, I've walked through your 500,000 foot department store and it seems like a run-on sentence. It's not distinguished, it's not punctuated. And so we created 42 different zones with different materials, different kinds of tile. Um, in the top left is the luxury zone, in the center on the top is the homeware zone, and on the right-hand side is the sports area. And then we created um, places where the retail areas could change. So on the bottom is a rendering for that sports zone for the introduction of a new skateboard. And we had pop-up areas in the luxury area for chocolate shops on Valentine's Day and Christmas. 
The last cross-pollination project is perhaps the most fantastic. We were asked to blend our favorite parts of the suburbs with our favorite parts of the city. And so we imagined this city for general growth properties with the density of Midtown Manhattan. So a suburb that's about half a mile by a mile in, uh, in its uh, dimensions, but built up vertically so that it would be as dense as Manhattan. So these are uh, a series of ideas about cross-pollination. And I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Weren't they fantastic? Mm -hmm. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Now's your chance. No one? Can I ask a few questions? Do we have time? Okay, you're here at Coverings, and I want to know how you walk through a show. Are you looking for products for a specific project generally? Are you seeking information uh, in general, or are you looking at things specifically for what you may be working on now or what you expect to be working on in the near future? I think... Um I'll take this. Um, I think when you go through the show, um, I think you're always looking for new ideas. So whether it's a project that you're working on currently or something that you just fall in love with and you want to use it at a later date, um, I have a spot in my office that I have a whole stack of things that I just can't get rid of because um, someday I will use them. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's an inspiring to see what your design teams are working on as far as the, the covering products, whether it's tiles, uh, large format, thin scale, like what we need to be using for some of our bigger projects. So, and how innovative you are getting with some of the technologies uh, for durability and cleanability of some of those things. So it's interesting to see what you guys have been doing on your research, and that's really kind of where we tend to, or at least I tend to kind of dive into. I, I would concur. It's, it's more about inspiration. And if something pops out at me that is also applicable for a particular project, that's great. But I'm looking for the creativity and the thing that's next and the thing that will inspire me to think creatively about its use and application. Go ahead, if here in front. Um, just with the cross-pollination, I was wondering if between, do any of you have something that really jumped out as unexpected cross-pollination? I think workplace and hospitality, those are very, go hand in hand, but just any example of something that was jumped out as very unexpected. I'll take that. I think um, something that's very unexpected, maybe it's expected, um, healthcare historically has been the most conservative of environments. And I think in several of these kind of images, you could see healthcare really taking on quite a different approach. If you would have worked on healthcare projects 10 years ago, you would have understood that everyone was gauging those projects for the um, institutional quality of the, of the project. And I think now even in places like exam rooms, um, treatment centers, you're actually seeing those become much softer. Uh, you're seeing them reflect kind of the notion of wellness. Um, you're seeing how space can actually, uh, you know, improve the human condition. And I think that's something that's very unexpected. And we've probably only started to, uh, you know, just scratch the surface of what those spaces could be. I'm going to do a follow-up to that, Todd. Yeah. Do doctors and the physicians, are they part of the process team? Yeah, I think there's a part of doing any kind of healthcare work or, you know, uh, project like this that uh, certainly the practitioners and the physicians are involved in the process. Uh, I think I've kind of spent a lot of time, our process is very different than theirs. 
Uh, theirs is based on the conditions in a laboratory that are very uh, defined and they often approach these projects in a scientific manner. They want to understand uh, what are the properties of the material, uh, does it harbor any kind of bacteria or viruses or things like that. I'm always shocked when I work on these projects how uh, you know physicians, researchers uh, can, can pull apart a material based on uh, what kind of uh, you know, bad things it could harbor. But absolutely, I think they're very involved, but often from a different lens than an aesthetic lens. Yeah, as an institution, um, thinking about healthcare, there are often other people that are huge influencers as well on a project team. And more and more, we're seeing HR representatives engaged in not just in healthcare, but in a wide variety of project types. We're often also engaged with representation from the board. And they're, all of these people and mm, interactions make for a greater deal of complexity. So in managing process and expected outcomes, we have um, a much more complicated work agenda, <laughs> if you will. And it's, it's not that it's a bad thing, it's that in the end you have a richer solution for the voices that have contributed, but it makes us rethink process as well. And is our process you know, the only way in which something can be done? And the answer is no. Um, and that we're constantly adjusting and shifting and reimagining our process to accommodate and to learn something new about how a solution is created because of that input and all of those voices. I think there's also a cross-pollination, again, within the workplace. You bring up well-being, and when we start looking at offices today or corporate environments today, it's well-being is the, the, the new norm. So how are we building these spaces that allow people the flexibility and the capabilities to do what they want? And how does that relate to where Coverings is? Is we're in a world of hackable design, so it's allowing all the users their own preferences while they're working in that space. So the durability and the flexibility of those spaces is becoming more challenging. The product needs to up, hold up because people are moving it more. So I think that's where we're starting to see the trends from, we have FinTech, so financial meets tech, and blending that into one environment and mixing the generations in there and giving all those people the preferences that they want is really going to be the important factor in the next few years is understanding how do we build the right products to allow that change to develop. We have a question on, over here. Um, so one of the trends I think that we're seeing is the idea of that millennial market driving some of the design choices and, and from what you guys have been talking about today you know, that is a certain driver of some of this cross-market pollination. And how do you see that um, continuing as this, you know, buying group becomes larger and larger? I'll take that. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the, the generation millennials, we should talk more about, <laughs> they don't seem to get enough play, but the, the, the reality is technology has such a driver influencing everything that we do it's, I, I think it's, it's a backlash against that to have the connections with people that are really important. And that's what all of these things are generating because you need opportunities to create the environment for the personal interaction to happen because you're always in your face within your phone. And um, the, the ironic thing is that, that there seems to be some sort of uh, retro aspect to all of the designs that go back to a different time, more wood, more warmth, and, and tech stuff is very cold and so that, that sort of sense of feeling about the spaces is what is, is what is driving those sort of the interactions and the direction that is taken from millennials which really is basic, a basic human uh, need to connect with somebody. We talk about you can work anywhere, well you can work anywhere because you're autonomous but in a office or a hotel you're with other people and that connection is very important. How do you enhance those connections with people? How does the space support all those things is really what the key is. Yeah, another thing about hotel lobbies, for example, people may be there for work, and they may be very intent on working, but they don't want to work alone in their rooms. They will come down to the lobby 
plug in and while they're concentrating on whatever device they're using, they're still part of a, of a group. It's and a choice to engage or disengage yeah. and having those ability to do that is really a key. Hello. Slightly off topic, but because of the knowledge and experience up there and nobody else is asking a question, um, you can do this fast. For all of you, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Where do you see wallpaper in the future, traditional wallpaper? I didn't see it in any of your pictures. Going to do a thumbs up or a thumbs down? I love it. I love wallpaper. Okay. <laughs> but you know, there, there, there's so much you can make your own now. You can make your own wall covering. You can print whatever you want. Um, I, I think really having artists who really do beautiful work with wall paper and wall covering is phenomenal if you've, if you've seen it really. I'm a thumbs up as well. I have a different opinion. <laughs> Only because as we've worked in the world of brand, there has been a notion that um, someone will save you a brand wall to treat and the idea is that you will treat it with wall covering as an expression and a communication device. So while at a general high level, yes, wallpaper can be beautiful, it can add a sense of luxury, it can do a lot of things to a space and, and be a wonderful addition and contribution. But when I think about it relative to the communication of brand, my experience and my notion about it changes. And I'm more interested today in exploring those three-dimensional representations of brand and how that enlivens an environment and changes its context. And so in that case, while there is still an opportunity for the introduction and integration of wall covering, my, my perception is jaded by how it's used and, and what the references have been. We've recently started to um, create murals for projects that are printed like wallpaper, printed on canvas and hung like wallpaper, but they're not, um, they're, they're project specific. And so it's taking painting and mixing it with digital technology, very high resolution scans, and then blowing it up um, to large scale to tell the story of the project. Yeah, I think I, on the wall covering side, I think we use it a lot more for durability reasons, and we have the capabilities of printing and designing it to what it, what it needs to be. Um, also, some of the technology that we're looking at with some of those coverings is the acoustic properties and the needs for some of those things within that wall covering. And I think technology, the further we push it, we still like those great textures. How do they help within our built environment for the functionality of the space? Um, and then, of course, if we can layer brand into it of some nature, it's always a plus. I think we're good. Question. Okay, I've been thinking about this for a little bit. With all the cross pollination, that's there's a lot of positive that comes with that. But is there um, a sort of ubiquitous danger or sameness, you know, that creeps in with all of that cross pollination happening? I don't think so. I think design is so many things. It's about uh, all five senses. And so I think the cross-pollination is actually something really interesting. For me, it actually signifies that there's still um, ingenuity in the world. Um, I love the notion of a mashup. And I talk a lot about things as not cross-pollination, but a mashup. I mean, who doesn't like Beyonce? Uh, and so this notion, right, that uh, you can actually take two things you can allow them to collide and create something different. Collaborations, mashups, all of these things, I think will be continue or will continue to be really interesting. I think some of them are always going to be huge failures, but I think many of them will be tremendous successes that will be sought out. I, I kind of see it as an evolution of individual industries. 
and that while each of those industries has specific needs, there are learnings from other industries that can advance their environments and inform those environments. And so while the healthcare industry may be trending towards something that feels more hospitality or spa-like or whatever the influence might be, the industry that informed it is also being impacted by something else and is growing and changing. So I don't think that it yields a sameness or that it should yield a sameness. What I think it is doing is spurring that other industry on to find their next and for them to begin to create those unique expressions that, that further define their, their own businesses or practices. What you're saying is, is as things evolve, each industry can learn from the other That's right. and evolve in turn. That's right. No one else? Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.